Hey, Barrett Edelstein here, your celeb expert and your celeb savant. Celeb Savant is a weekly entertainment show. We have long-form career retrospective type interviews with celebrities, singers, actors, and industry experts. Wendy Oldfield has been a performer and creator of beautiful music since 1983. She first rocketed into the spotlight with the rock group The Sweat Band and had a number of hits, including the very popular This Boy, which charted on all major radio stations. In 1989, Wendy Oldfield branched out into a solo career and released her first solo album called Beautiful World. This album saw a solid number of hits for debut solo artists such as Acid Rain, Miracle, Don't Stop Believing and Living in a Real World. The next few years, Wendy Oldfield's style grew and changed, ever consistent with dynamic lyrical content. Ruby, Pale Blue Dot, Holy Water and Supernova followed over the next 20 years. Songs like Holy Water, Sun, New Dress and Burden became huge favourites at all her live performances in South Africa. Wendy Oldfield has been nominated for a total of seven South African Music Awards, of which she has won two for Best Female Vocalist and also Best Pop Album, with two more for her children's albums Sing Along Kids Volume 1 and Sing Along Kids Volume 2. Wendy consistently releases new music and tours South Africa with welcoming audiences at all her shows. Up next on Celeb Savant, we've got Wendy Oldfield. Where do we find you in the world? What's happening in your life and how are you doing? Yeah. How's it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how whether to start with the first one or the let me start with the first one. I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to this interview. And um, where I am in the world is in wilderness at the moment. I'm at uh, my house that I stay at and... Uh, sort of a little breather in between some shows this weekend and then next weekend. And I'm contemplating the rest of my life. <laughs> so for, the, for the overseas listeners, so we have a lot of overseas listeners. So you've heard of Johannesburg, you've heard of Cape Town, you maybe have heard of Durban. So the wilderness in relation to Durban, how far is that, Wendy? It's sort of, if you went all the way up coast, it's probably about a quarter of the way to Durban. Okay. Maybe okay. a little bit less, maybe maybe a fifth. Okay. If you just kept driving, which you can't, but yeah. So overseas listeners, if you just go a quarter to Durban and you stop, you might oh. see Wendy there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the little small seaside village, but it's also mountainous as well. How long have mm. you been living there for? For 20 years this year. 10? I've uh, tw- 20, 20. In wilderness, 20. Yeah, 20 years in Joburg. And 19 years in Cape Town. So what made you move to the wilderness? Uh, you know, I've always been a farmy type girl. Okay. You know, when I finished school, I went and moved up onto a farm in Simonstown with, uh, when I was playing with my first band. But then we moved to Joburg, which is entirely different. Yet the places I lived were kind of always the same. I always ended up in houses with big trees in the back, you know, in the back yeah. of that. I've always yearned for the country so when I fell pregnant um, with my third child which came as a a great surprise Hmm. um, because my second was only eight months old oh my first was only yeah I was only two and um, then I just decided if I'm going to do this thing I can do it anywhere because I'm still doing the same thing so I'd rather not do it in Joburg so we moved down to the wilderness yeah and then I had my babies here then you had your babies there So now let's rewind to the very beginning. So you've been in the entertainment industry a number of years. Yes. At what age did you get invigorated and motivated to be in the entertainment industry? And what inspired that and the hybrid version of the Wendy Oldfield story? (laughs) Well, I always wanted to sing and act. Um, When I was small, I was always doing the the leads and all the school plays and everything, which was something I was very into and I wanted to pursue it. You know, when you, you're kind of good at something, you get recognized for being good at it. So it makes you feel good. So you kind of get better at it. It's one of those things. I think that's why people end up doing these things. At it. It's because, you know, you get propelled into this thing. Yes. So then when I was sick, my mom was like, what are you going to do next year? And I said, I was going to be a singer. And she was like, how? And I'm just going to, I don't know. I'm just going to do it. 
Um, but uh, she advised me to do something while I was trying to become a singer. Okay. Which she didn't, I don't think she thought I'd ever do. <laughs> and she said, it will be fun if you did it. It would be nice as a hobby on weekends. Anyway, <laughs> while I was studying teaching, uh, one of the girls in the same year as me came and asked me, because I had formed a little singing group, she came and asked me if I wanted to be a singer for a rock band because the, ba- the sweat band was looking for a new singer. Yeah. And so I auditioned for them probably about three days later. And from the very next night, I don't think my mom ever saw me again. It was <laughs> like I just got in and that was it. We rehearsed every single night, we gigged every single weekend. And then I moved to Joburg with them. So then the next leg was when I was in Johannesburg. Okay. Sweat band, yes. two years of fame. Yes, you know, there's 15 seconds of fame. Yeah, we killed it for about two years and then we split up. So all in all, about six years together. And then I went solo and then had acid rain and real world. And there was a song I had called Miracle. Quite a few that came off my first uh, debut album. And then I re- I've i released another six albums since then over the period of time. One which I released in 2021 mm-hmm. at the end of you know, time. Hey? It's, yeah. it's real weird these days. Oh, absolutely. And um, yeah, an album called Salt. All my albums have had songs on radio and remember radio. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 was like, I was actually listening to yeah. the radio the other day and uh, you came on. I was like, ah, oh, there's my friend Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my kids have grown up here, the side, and I sort of satellite from here. Okay. Um, I'm doing a lot of live work. Um, I'm coaching a bit of a me- coach slash mentoring a bit of kid. Um, Kids and vocals and songwriting and just general coaching all in all, mm. and which I really love. And um, writing songs all the time and performing with different musicians. You know, this weekend I'm performing with Steve Newman and next weekend with Robin Ald. Um, so I'm on the go. On the go, go, and go. On the go, 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 yes. <laughs> I have two kids. And now my children are studying in Cape Town and Johannesburg. So Okay. I'm so yeah, in between them as well. And I have my partner lives in Durist. So I'm over the mountain as well, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. Okay. I love it because I write songs in the car. So travel time for me is rehearsal time, you know. While you're actually physically driving. Yeah. I sing. Okay. You know, your mind is, is unthinking. There's a big a hole in your head and you stop sort of thinking about anything and you get into that feeling, you know, that when you're driving. And I just sing continuously. So by the time I get to Cape Town, I don't even know I'm there. And then I've sung and sung. And I'm not thinking about what I'm singing. So okay. it's a very nice yeah, it's a very nice time. You see, you, you're not like me. I hate driving long distances. If it's further than 30 minutes, I start getting irritated. It's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> My well, bum's numb. Yeah. Where, aren't we there yet? <laughs> Just, I've I've had three kids in cars, so you must know. <laughs> Any drive without children is magnificent. Okay. And people who have kids will they'll understand, especially <laughs> three children between three slash four years. Yeah. So, yeah. So the first time I drove without them, I was like, oh my word! I think I'm just going to become a truck driver <laughs> as my job because <laughs> it was so pleasant. And I don't do really long drives; maybe five, six hours. I'd take a little break in between. Yeah. And yeah. I t- Oh, and, uh, and they're always beautiful rides all to Cape Town usually or through the, you know, the Karoo or something like that. Uh, you mentioned those killing at the 15 seconds of fame and then you did the solo work. The difference between being part of the band and Wendy Oldfield solo, was there any difference or how, how was that transition? It was completely different. Yeah, once you've been in a band, and I mean, people who've been in bands will know the band. It's about the band. The band was the only thing that was in my life. I think I missed my best friend's wedding because I had a rehearsal. Yeah, I didn't even, I was like, sorry, I've got a rehearsal. Um, I'll come afterwards. <laughs> you never cancel a rehearsal for something. You never canceled rehearsals for anything. Yeah. It was like, that was it. The commitment's there. And when you're in a band like that, there's something it's amazing because if the, if the gig is shit, then you all, you don't blame nothing. It's like you're one unit, a force to be reckoned with, you know. So when it changes to Wendy Oldfield, it's different and it's, it's you know, swings and roundabouts. Then you've got Say, 
yet autonomous I can pretty much move around because I could be Wendy Oldfield doing this, trying this genre and mixing this genre and that genre, which was kind of difficult in the band. So they were very, I mean, it's, it's great as well, but at the same time, um, we, and, and I come from the days was when the band broke up, the band broke up. It wasn't like, okay, we're going to go for two years and I'm going to do a solo album. <laughs> He's going to, and yeah. then we'll get back to the yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't really happen in, um, uh, it was, yeah, it kind of didn't really happen that way when you left the band, then the band was done, you know? Yeah. And, uh, anyway, so I went solo and then after that, I've had many, many, many bands and, um, you know, got, I've got musicians all over South Africa that I've played with and know my stuff. So if I go to places, I book guys and we rehearse together and it's different, you know, because um, you're the boss. Even if, even if you're not, you know, I, I look, you know, I don't be, be the boss because yes, you're yes, a band, yes. but that thing is different. You kind of have more responsibility towards those guys, uh, cause they could sort of in your employee instead of, well, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Type of thing. But, um, but also they, I mean, all the musicians I book are so fantastic and I know them so well. So there's no issues with, um, musical intimacy. Dare I use that? But it is because, you know, we all know each other. And then when you land in it, you don't have to get to know each other. Don't have to learn each other. Yeah, so it's great. And I love that too. Because, yeah, for me, there's a big difference. And I think if you spoke to two guys that have been in bands and women, they'll say the same thing. Would Once you I s- became Wendy old, old yes. Oldfield, I could never be banned again. Would you say that being in a band gives a bit of an anonymity? An- 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 <laughs> I'm trying to get the word out. A nanominity. Anonymity. That's the word. We're getting there. Anonymity. Still can't get it. Anyway, we know what we're talking about. Two, um, it gives a sort of a protection compared to, oh, that's Wendy compared to, oh, that's the band. In what sense do you mean? Like from the public or? Yes. I suppose in a way, but because, I mean, you still, yeah, you feel, Threatened as a band. You never feel like take it personally. You feel threatened as a band. Like, whoa, they said something about, you know. There is a, yeah, there is a sense of, I mean, just we would, we would arrive at gigs together. We'd never say I'll meet you at someone's gig. Because, you know, we spent, we did a lot of that. You know, you hang out at your mate's bright blue was around and we'd always meet and then walk in together. It was a thing. It was a thing. <laughs> so people would turn and go, oh, there's the sweat band. Um, and it was it was lack of us. Also, we never went on stage by you know one at a time. Did we always tuned up, went off stage, and then we went on together. It was a it's a it's a very nice thing. I try and do that with my guys anyway. The the bands I play with. Now you mentioned you're still writing songs. So from zero to three to four minutes. Yes. What inspires that? What motivates it? You mentioned you you do a lot of it while you're driving. Is it easy all the time? Tell us the Wendy Oldfield journey of creating a song. You know, it's something that's so different for me. I, I don't really have, I can't really nail it down to like giving anyone a lesson in it. Because yeah. um, for me, writing a song is content based at the same time as sort of, uh, I, I usually write melody lines first because I'm always singing. If yeah. I'm up, drives everyone nuts, my kids. They would say, you don't even hear yourself. I'm mm, singing stuff. And so, <laughs> so I'm not thinking about it. And, and melodies that stick, yeah, they stick. You see, then suddenly I go, ah, oh, okay. I start recognizing something that I'm humming or singing. And then I'll be like, ah, oh, there you are. That's okay. I'll come back again. Then I'll start humming it again. And, and then words will kind of emerge. The more I start singing it, I make sounds. And then the words emerge. I don't think about the words. They just come out my mouth. Yes. And then I go, oh, that's nice. I like that. I can see because it's usually something that's in my, that I've got a lens on. Yeah. Um, something that's, yeah, I'm thinking about. And, and um, so something will come out and I'll just leave it and work on that line. And I'm very trusting of it. And it, sometimes the whole thing disappears. It comes back again in four years. <laughs> yeah, I, but I put it away. I mean, I just carry on and things formulate. And when they've got to a stage that I, I know after the whole thread is there and even though I might have to tighten up lyrics, then I'll record it just, you know, with my phone. I don't do it. I don't do, Oh, I've got a line and record it. Cause I'm, my training is of not having that around me. 
So I've never done that. I've always just sort of trusted that the thing that stays alive will stay alive. And then the content is important, very important. People have sort of lost the interest in that. Yeah. But it seems to me when I listen to songs. But um, And the weight of the word that you use, according to the whole, the pentameter, like, oh, it's a it's a very fine thing. You can feel it when something's uncomfortable, a line in someone's song, or it doesn't sit right. Yes. Then you have to take away that you know, and find the right thing. And then, and then it has to all work together. I suppose resonate would be the word, but that's kind of how, how I do it. And sometimes I work with the band and we, I'll give them some like a groove and a this, and then I'll come up with a melody on top of that. So that's also how I, I write when I write with people. I'm not sure if you're aware of, if you or all the listeners are aware, some of the listeners who've listened to all my podcasts, thank you, by the way, hashtag, um, would have heard me speak uh-huh. to another artist around this. So each person processes information differently. Some people process visually, some people process auditory, some people f- process kinesthetically. So kinesthetically yes. is the feeling. So when you're listening to songs by other people, for example, are you an audio person? You have the words or the feeling kinesthetically or visual. You get the feeling and you can see it. Which one is for you the most dominant? Um. I suppose the audio, I don't really listen to the song like intensely. If a song is there, I listen to, I just feel it. Actually, I feel the song through my ears. I'm not super visual person, although I have to say in the last few years, I've got more and more into photographs and that kind of thing. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it. And I can, you don't have to sell me. If a song is playing and I'm like, I'll just immediately in the sort of second verse go, ooh, you long verses, why are you <laughs> why do you keep using that word over and over? You should okay. second chord into a minor, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then if it's yeah, I immediately start bloody like idols judging it, you know. <laughs> if, if it doesn't work for me and I'm sitting and I'm listening to something, I'll just but it doesn't have to be fantastic. The honesty of the song can grab you as well. You know, it's not about the production and there's something that's a thing. That's the thing. Yes. You know what I mean? That just gets it. I'm not saying that that song makes it to number one. It's I'm not talking about that kind of songwriting yeah. or, or pop songwriting, but you know what I mean. Good yeah. songwriting. Uh, also, and also uh, the, the energy. Yes, absolutely. And when everything fits, like I say, the weight of the, the line and how it ends and the chord that happens underneath it and the voicings that are used. And, and I hate songs that are sentimental or shove things down your throat or, you know, that aren't elegantly laid out, you know. So, yeah, uh, yeah so that's and, but, so that's it. Eh, when the whole thing fits together and it's just, it's just great. I, it's through the feeling, yeah, it's an audio feeling. More than an audio, like, or oh, the sound, you know what I mean? More yes, the... yes, yes, yes. You mentioned earlier that you are coaching kids and mentoring them. What about that do you enjoy? There's a certain age group. I'm actually not at the moment. Um, I'm just coaching one uh, lady at the moment, but she's not a kid. Anyway, the thing about teenagers, if you refer to to a reminder to the world it's a a video and a song that i i did with these kids from wilderness teenagers from wilderness um it's on youtube they were all about 14 15 16 uh, and want to sing they all want to be singers so it's very different to sitting in a, a room with a bunch of kids that you're getting to do something that don't want to do. These teenagers were, I I mean, I said to them, listen, you you can talk as much as you like, but then you must go outside and do it on the balcony and that. And, but if you come inside and you want to watch, you've got to be quiet. And I never, they never went outside once. They sat inside the whole, in the studio on the couches and they watched each one, watched the other one do their part. They didn't make a peep. They listened. They were so engaged when I was giving them advice, you know, like, Coaching them on the vocals. Oh, they were so beautiful to work with. Slightly older, like 19 and 20 year olds who sort of got into bands or I've heard their stuff and they're playing. They don't want anyone to tell them what to do. Or, yeah. They know yeah, it all. We know it all. Yeah, the, the, the ego gets in the way there. You know? Yeah. And uh, that's, that's the time when they should be coached the most because they're about to blossom, you know, and um, just need a little 
fixing up the songs and um, and that's when it's harder. But at a, at a slightly young age, so that's kind of the age I want all musicians that come to me, you know, singers that come to me. It's hard <laughs> to go up to a band and go, you know what, I really, if you came to me for three lessons, I could show you how to fix that weird thing that you do <laughs> when you go into a high note. They don't like that. Yeah, so um, people that really want singers that want to. People that want to become singers are super keen, but there's a certain bracket. Yeah, they do, they just don't. And I like the younger ones. Yeah, they are like sponges. And well, I also I, wish I'd been yeah. I'd been given the advice, you know, and the guidance yeah. that um, I could give yes. when I was that age. I had no, you know, when I was in the band, there was no one. I'm not boohooing because it wasn't a bad thing. I had to learn along the way, yes. but it would have been useful to yes. have like a different eye on things with someone who you trust. So I made all of those errors and did all of that stuff. And um, I can see where where you can trip up so easily at the early stages of your, the beginnings of your career. Let's speak of an imaginary person who's getting into it and that. What are the, some of the common areas that a person normally trips up in if they don't have the advice or guidance? Don't believe the bullshit people tell you. Don't believe the hype. You know, any don't, that's it confuses you. Remember, it's about the music. Have a, have a purpose and um, know that how you're feeling now, you're going to feel differently in ten years' time and about you, everything. Now, so, I was going to say, I think like pop music is the best thing, and I'm never going to don't don't do those things. Go, yeah, yeah. This is where I am now, and I'm open to. You know, that's a way better way of, of moving forward. So just be open and know who you are, because you see some of these artists that get swept up in the thing then you read articles afterwards of after they've won this competition that competition of our they didn't have a voice they were made into this image that wasn't them and then they came out yes. there at the end and spat out and now it's like they're all bitter and twisted uh, I, well i think a lot of those competitions i, I love what my daughter saves me some of them and i watch and these amazing singers there but that is literally 15 seconds of fame because I've watched some of the winners of the talent ones and the voice ones and the idolsy ones and that. The American watch their, some shows after that that they've done after they've won or become second. Oh, man, it's it's never the same. You're never going to have the same band. You're never going to have the same lights, the yes. same backing vocalists, the same media attention, you know, and that's the beginning. And so... It's just pretty much downhill for a lot of them from there, from that thing. It's also because a lot of them aren't necessarily what it's made them out to be. So now you've got to go and backtrack and find that out. So how worthwhile that sort of thing is. Yeah, I've spoken like the one guy I spoke to, I'm not mentioning names, but I spoke to one guy who was the winner of The Voice UK, another girl who's in the finest of The Voice UK. They thought, ah, ah, afterwards it's going to be, bah, like, whatever. And then it was yeah. like, and now what? Nothing. Yep. And there was like. Now you've got to come up with songs that are equal to the songs you've sung to win it. Man's World. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like these powerful songs that everybody knows. Heard it from the grapevine. Uh, what's the Whitney Houston? <laughs> yeah, I'll Always yeah. Love You. All those massive, massive hits. That's what you've won them on. You've won those shows on those hits, and now you've got to come out with an album. Actually, you could come out with covers, but that yeah. ain't going to be sustaining at all. Yeah. And to now try and find the same strength of song to keep that career going, bam, bam. How many? Maybe Kelly Clarkson. I don't know. The only one. Maybe who's the other one? Uh, Adam Lambert. Two that I Will Young. Adam Lambert. Couple, and, a few, yeah. and how many of there are they since it started? Exactly. Hundreds. You know, so it's it's like the music industry. It's the same thing. You, know, you start off, there's thousands of people in the music business. By like 26, 27, if you haven't cracked it, you fall back on what you know, what you've studied, or you get into like record, you get into the record business. And uh, not so many by the time you get to 40. It's interesting you say that because I reaches, recently read an article that the top <clears throat> radio stations in the UK, and they only mentioned females. I don't know. Yes. Why males are special. But if a female artist is over 30, these top radio stations won't play them anymore. Ellie Goulding, Rita Ora, they they are now has-beens, according to the radio stations, inverted commas. Don't start me. <laughs> yeah. Don't so, start me. <laughs> mm. 
Mm. I was talking to Robin the other day and saying, I've been thinking about it. But this is the template for, for music. I've never heard of anyone having a number one hit over the age of 50. Have you ever heard of someone breaking into the market? Now, that should be credible because – if you think about it, the, the music I release now is way better than the hit I had when I was 20. It's just that it's just, no, you're not allowed. You know what I mean? You're, that you're not played, even though it's the same genre as what's happening on stations or similar to that are yes. putting pop, you know, yeah. indie music on. But because I'm 59, it's kind of like, but everyone else is 24. But it's not about the music. They're not seeing the music. They're seeing me. You know, it's such a weird thing. And it's crazy. It's like people want to put you on the legend stage. I mean, you know, it's sort of like, hey, man, I'm working here. It's crazy. So I know even I look at Arno, you can, the last hit, you've got to be under 35. You know, I think it's around about 35. Robin and I were going back. Even Sting, Free Free, because he has albums and everyone knows them and his fans will all buy them. But it will never be what I've noticed on like a station and be that thing, the new Sting song. It'll just be with fans follow and off you go. It's, it's that sort of thing, even though it's as funky and groovy as the, he, as the stuff he did 30 years ago. Exactly. It's a, it's a weird phenomenon. I'm the only female <laughs> white uh, indie rock slash blast singer that, um, and then the next, one is about 43 I think I don't know how old Laurie is but the round of our thing yeah. is a massive gap it's yeah it's hard for a woman in the industry to keep going as a professional and have the family so I love this game my recipients don't yeah. always like this game and you'll understand why in a moment I know if I had to ask you this question in two minutes two days two hours I know your answer will be uh, different each time okay. if you had to push play to five songs by other artists once we finish this chat, what would those five songs be and by whom? I would say Special Agents by Chris, Chris Letcher. Mm -hmm. He was the lead singer and writer of Urban Creep. I would say Genie by the Springbok Nude Girls. I would say Window on the World by Bright Blue. I would say Robin Ault, his new song Underground. Hey, that's number four. And number five, yes. I would say Bay of Bombay by Jennifer Ferguson. The podcast is listened to throughout the world. As a final message yes. to the listening audience, what would you like to say? I would like to say that life is precious. And um, this is a thing that came up for me this whole weekend. It's a weird thing. People was often talking to me about what someone had done. And I said, oh, you know, it's so weird. It keeps coming up, this thing. You can't change anyone. You know, the only thing you can do is know what they are and allow people to treat you in a certain way. You allow how people treat you. Exactly. And it's kind of been standing out and I've been telling people, well, you allow it, you know. So there you go. That's my bit, my little drop for the week. It's not about music, but it's sure to come up somewhere in a song. There we go. So as Wendy says, you allow how people treat you. So what do you choose? This is Celeb Savant signing out. Yeah.